Hi everybody, this is Brian James from Rhino3D.com and in this video I want to show you how you can use displacement meshes in Rhino. I'm going to start by making a flat plane. I'll make it 20 by 20 inches and I want to use an image to create geometry here, so rising and falling based on the grayscale values in an image. I'll select the plane and in the properties panel I'll go to the displacement section, which is that orange sphere with the bumps on it. I'll click to assign a texture. Now here's a list of textures that Rhino comes with, and these are called procedural textures. I'll start with the granite texture, which has some black values and some gray values. When we turn it on, those values are used to create geometry at those locations on the plane. Within the displacement settings, you can choose the amount of polygons that will be used to create the detail. By default, the setting is medium, but if you change it to high or very high, you will then see that you get a lot more detail. So it's a combination of the pixels and grayscale values in the image, as well as the number of polygons used. I'll go into the side view and enter shaded mode so we can take a look at the height of the displacement mesh. Currently I'm not getting to one inch in height because the granite texture doesn't have any white values in it. If you click the edit pencil next to the texture you can change that gray color to white and now any area in the image that equals that white area will go to the value set for the white point in the displacement which will be one inch. When working with displacement meshes, it's good to work in either the medium or high quality setting so that you don't have to wait too long for changes to update and only raise the quality, the amount of polygons used, once you're ready for it to have more detail. You can click the pencil icon as we just did next to the texture to edit and you'll get a floating window. That texture can be edited here in terms of the color used or the repeat value, but I prefer using the render drop-down menu and the texture editor. This will create a separate panel. If you're on Mac, use the window drop-down menu and the floating panels fly out to get a floating texture editor. I'll dock the panel here in Rhino 7 for Windows by dragging its title bar this allows me to edit the texture outside of a floating dialog. If we change the repeat value in the mapping section, the displacement will recalculate, but we're still using the same number of polygons. If we decrease the repeat, it'll appear crisper, but it's only because there's less detail that the polygons need to represent. If we zoom in, I'll show you some other settings that I like to try refine sensitivity of 1 instead of 0.5 in the advanced settings, or turning on the fairing option. These will especially change those ridges where the transition from white to black occurs. You can also change the refined steps in the advanced setting, but this is really the same as changing the initial quality, so I prefer putting them back to their defaults and just changing it from high to very high, and the result is the same. Depending on your texture and the object that gets the displacement, you can try combinations of these settings. But remember while working, change your quality to medium or high so that you don't have to wait too long for any changes to update. Another factor to consider in the quality of the displacement is the render mesh of the object. You can use the command show render mesh to visualize the polygons that the image in the displacement property has to work with. More polygons will equal more detail, and you can use the hide render mesh command to hide that wireframe. Rhino lets you override the render mesh of an object in the properties panel. You can click the custom mesh checkbox there and then the adjust button. Here you can change the settings used for the render mesh, and this in turn allows the displacement to have more or less polygons. I'll uncheck the simple planes option since I'm working with a plane, and I'll click preview. I'll make the density one and zero out these other fields. 
and I'll just adjust the minimum edge and maximum edge length possible. I'll put it to a tenth for both and then click preview again. If I click OK, this is now the render mesh for the object and the displacement will use that as the base. If I go back to the displacement properties, that initial quality dropdown doesn't have as much of an impact now. So this is not a requirement but more of an optional way of using displacement by using a custom render mesh for the selection. You can experiment with combinations or either one of these techniques, but make sure to know the size of your object so that you don't make too small of an edge length in your custom render mesh. Now this is an object displacement and most of the time people will want to extract this mesh as an actual object. For that you can use the command extract render mesh. The displacement will be extracted and the original surface will remain. So I'll select the mesh that was just extracted with extract render mesh and I'll drag it off to the side. We can display mesh wires in the display mode and zoom in, you can see it's quite dense, so I usually will keep the mesh wires off in the display mode using that setting in the display panel. I'll also disable the displacement property for the plane. There's no need to have it on any longer. Rhino allows you to also create displacement meshes as part of a material property. I'll click the plus symbol in the materials panel and load a substance SBSAR file. You'll need to have the Substance Importer plugin, which is available in the Package Manager command. After that, if you have access to the Adobe Substance Catalog, you can load Substance files directly into Rhino, and the Rhino renderer will use them. Here I have a very bumpy substance material called Train Wood Dock, and I'm going to apply it to the plane, and I won't see it in shaded mode like we did with the other displacement type in Rhino. But if I go into the render display mode, you will see it. In the rendering panel, I'll uncheck the ground plane so we can see the, the depth of this displacement in the material. Now we're using a custom render mesh on this plane still from properties, and that's what's giving us the number of polygons necessary to actually see the detail. If I uncheck that, it looks like the whole thing is getting raised. I want to show you the property. It's called height in the substance material in the texture setting. If you uncheck that and check it again, you'll see the whole thing leaves the selection wireframe there. So we need to use that custom render mesh ability in properties in order to see this height or displacement amount within the substance material. Almost all substance materials I've downloaded from Adobe have this height turned on already. So just know that this is how you're going to be able to use it by using a custom render mesh. Uh, otherwise, just disable that height quality if you don't need it. Now there's a bunch of technical parameters in the substance material. The height range, I think, is the most important one here. So set that quality based on your unit of measurement. If you click the plus symbol in the materials panel, you could alternately start with a physically based material and add a displacement channel. I'll assign this new physically based material to my plane and in the texture slot for the displacement I'll add a picture of a rock surface. I'll also add a base color channel and I'll add the same image, the same photograph to that color channel. Next to the texture in the material used for displacement you can change the value for the height and this will relate to the white pixels in the image. It's a photograph and you have a lot of pixels in this particular example which creates a very spiky effect It'll look better if we blur the image, and you could do this externally, or you could do it within Rhino using something called a resample texture. So within the texture editor, I'll click the plus symbol and start with a resample texture. In the texture slot to resample, I'll add that same photo of the rock surface. In the resampling category, you pick the number of pixels, and I'll use 512 by 512. 
in the blur section you can enable blur and then pick the type. If you plan on tiling the image make sure to check the wrap U and wrap V values. We can now change the texture used in that displacement channel by clicking the icon to the right of the name of the texture. I'll then choose from more types, start from existing, and pick the resample texture that I just made. I won't make it a child of the existing texture in there. And now the displacement will recalculate using that blurred or resampled image. I'll make the height greater so you can see the effect. And now we don't have those spiky details because we've smoothed out or blurred the pixels next to one another. The color texture is still the original photo though and that completes the effect. Now that we've covered the displacement basics within Rhino, I want to show you a more real-world example where we have uh, an actual product that needs some texture. Here I have a bicycle grip and usually you have a texture around that main cylindrical surface. This was originally a sub-D model and I used two NURBS to create this poly surface. I'll sub-object select that top surface with control shift click. That will be command shift click if you're on Mac. And now within properties displacement I can add a sub-object displacement. This is a real key difference from the plane example in that it will not rip apart at the edge where it meets the other surfaces. I'll change that height value to something more realistic like 0.1 and I can change the repeat value in the texture editor for the applied sub-object displacement. Notice how it's crunching up, it's getting tighter right at the edges because in this poly surface the texture mapping method as I'll show here in properties is set to by surface. So I'm going to set it to cylindrical instead and I'll set this up in the right view with the capped option equals yes so that I have a cap for the very end. And when I go back into perspective now I don't have the squeezing or crunching up of that texture on the very end. I do have some interference from the end cap of the cylinder so I'll show the mapping widget and I'll scale this down in 2D holding shift over that two axis handle and dragging on the gumball and that's going to get rid of the interference from the end cap projection. It'll just be the sidewall of the cylindrical projection now. In order to edit the quality for a sub-object displacement you have to select the entire object otherwise that quality drop-down won't be available to you. And remember the custom render mesh that we had set up in properties? You can use that but if you don't have that enabled, if that checkbox is not checked there for the custom render mesh, the render mesh that it's using is based on the settings for the document. So if you go to document properties and then the mesh section, this is where you're going to see the base mesh that any displacement is going to use. So your displacement drop-down will control the detail just as it did in the plane example when using a sub-object displacement. But you can only adjust that quality setting if the entire object is selected. I want to take a look at some other possible ideas for a texture on the handle. So I want to settle on a quality level that updates quickly for me. So that'll usually be medium or high. And then within the texture editor, I'll click the plus symbol to import a new texture. I'll import it from the library and open the textures folder. There are a number of black and white grayscale textures here and I'll choose this dots one that has a blur to it. Now within the texture properties for the sub-object displacement you can swap out the texture. So again control shift click that surface and then click the drop down for the texture and just change it to the displacement that you want. 
anything in the texture editor is going to show up there. And then we can change the repeat value back in the texture editor and we'll see that change. So the object doesn't have to be selected, we'll just make the edit in the texture editor. I want this dot texture to be more circular, so I'm playing with the repeat values separately by unlinking the U and V values there. What's nice is once you get the aspect ratio correct, the proportions correct, then you can relink the U and V repeat values and now when you change one, the other one will proportionally change. Note that you get a fall off between the highest and lowest points of the displacement and that's because of the blur in that image. I'll change the white point value to something less intense. I want to add another texture to the end cap of the handle here. So I can sub-object select those faces and they'll have their own sub-object displacement option. You could add a texture directly in the displacement properties for this sub-object, or you could alternately add a texture to the texture editor. If I click bitmap texture and pick a photograph, or in this case a drawing of the letter R, that black and white image will then be available to me in the displacement settings. So now when I click the drop down here for the texture, I have anything that's shown in the texture editor. And this displacement isn't enabled yet, so we have the option to set the white point and black point values. So for everywhere that's white in the image, I'll say zero height, no height at all, and I'll give a negative value to the black areas of the image so that it just debosses it a little bit in that area. And then when I enable it, you can see the effect. Now the mapping is the end cap of the cylindrical mapping method, and that's why I chose the cap option when I set up that cylindrical mapping method. There's a lot of little detail in that letter R drawing. It's got a rough edge to the stroke and so I'll need to have a very high quality setting for the displacement in order to see all that detail. Maybe I'll make that emboss, that deboss a little less. Now I want to play a little bit more with the texture used on the main surface. So I'll go back into the texture folder in the material library and I'll grab something that doesn't have a blur to it, like this hex grid image. Just like when we did the rock photograph on the plane, it's often the case that you need to blur an image in order to get the proper effect. So I'll change my displacement to this hex grid texture for the sub-object of the main cylindrical surface on the handle. And it's currently only tiled one by one. But in the texture editor, we can change that repeat value. So I'll unlink the values and I'll also change that quality for the sub-object displacement, selecting the whole object to do it, just so that my update will be faster and I'll repeat it six in one direction and nine in the other. And I believe that should give me hexes. Pretty close. Now, even if we raise that quality to very high and I zoom in, you'll see that we have a jagged edge because we don't have vertices that are absolutely right along those diagonal lines of the hexagon. So what I'll do is resample the hex grid image and so I'll do the same thing again that I did before. I'll create a resample texture. I'll click the texture to resample. Choose from more types. Start from existing. And then pick that hex grid. I'm going to have share all settings enabled so that it makes what's called an instance of it. 
and you can see the little letter I on it. This means that if I change the base texture, it will update its use within the resample texture. I'm doing the same settings with blur and resampling. Also make sure to only change the repeat values in the source texture instead of the resample texture. And then change the texture used in the subobject displacement to that resample texture. And now we get a smoother result instead of the more jagged result. I'm going to adjust the radius for the blur in the resample texture so that it's not as blurred. And I'll increase the quality for the displacement. I'll use the command zoom and then the one-to-one -one option next. I like to do this to check the physical size of the object. So this is six inches long and on the large monitor this is about how big it is. I'll then use extract render mesh and this will extract the displacement mesh. If the ultimate goal is 3D printing, this will provide us with a closed mesh to export as an STL file. I'll hide the original polysurface object, and now I just have the extracted render mesh. I'll go into my top view, and I want to sub-object select this jagged edge here. So I'll hold down Control and Shift and drag a window selection. This will select quite a few mesh edges faces, and vertices. I'll then use the smooth command and it'll take a moment for the dialog to pop up but there's two sliders here. There's a smooth factor per step and number of steps. I'm going to have a smooth factor of one and this is going to smooth it in X, Y, and Z as noted at the top of the dialog. And then the number of smooth steps I'll perform is 10 and then I'll say OK. And this will smooth out that transition between the displaced sub-object surface and the adjacent surface. I'll do the same thing here. Control shift click and drag a window and then use the smooth command again. I'll just right click in the command line and then pick smooth. And this will again take a moment because there's 20,000 some odd edges selected there. And then I'll go back to my perspective view and we've smoothed out that transition. Now it's a little bit chunky and that's actually a weld value that uh, needs to be changed. So I'll select the mesh, run the weld command and I'll leave the tolerance at 90 degrees and uh, and that will make it look smoother again. If you do this sub-object displacement technique on a closed model your extracted render mesh will also be a closed mesh and you can export that as an STL for 3D printing. I want to show you one more technique here using something called Show Z Buffer to create custom images that you can then use for other displacements. Now I've gone back to that plane that we had in the beginning and I'm going to disable that custom mesh and I'm just going to work with the documents render mesh. And this will mean that I have to change the quality setting in the displacement property. And we're looking at a 4x4 tiling of the granite texture at the moment. And if I swap out the texture in the displacement properties, it changes the 3D displacement. Now if I want to save a 2D image of this 3D displacement, I can do it this way. I'll start with the command New Floating Viewport. I'll copy the existing viewport of perspective and then in properties, because it's floating, I can change the width and height. It's not bound by its neighbors. So I'll change it to 1024 by 1024. 
and I'll set the view to top. I want to focus in on that displacement surface in the top view, so I'll use the command orient camera to surface to SRF and I'll use a center O snap there. You could also zoom selected and if you select the object ZS and enter that also will get you real close but there's a little bit of a gap and I need this to be exactly 1024 by 1024. So I'll use the camera command and toggle the camera on for that viewport and then in another view I can grab the endpoint and snap it to the end of the curve using my object snaps. And then the camera is per viewport, so I have to select that floating viewport again and run the camera command again to toggle off the camera. But now my floating viewport is exactly 1024 by 1024. Now I want to see a black and white version of the depth buffer as it's called. So the command is show Z buffer. And that's going to give me a grayscale image of the high and low points in the image. Show Z buffer is a toggle. So if I run it in perspective, it turns it on and off as well. And it's easier to probably understand what's going on in that context. But in the top view, we have this parallel projection now of our 3D displacement. So as I swap out my displacement image, it changes what that top view is looking at. To save the image out, you can use the command view capture to file when the floating viewport is active. View capture to file has a scale field. If you have a scale of one, it will be the size of your viewport and you can increase it here to get larger images and then save them out as a JPEG or PNG for use elsewhere. And that's how you use displacement and show Z buffer in Rhino 7. Thanks for watching.